So today, uh, we have um, HIV uh, and HIV stigmatization. That is the focus of our discussion today. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Steven, uh, who will be making the presentation uh, uh, for us. Uh, I would like to introduce him a bit before I hand over the button to him to start the presentation. So uh, his full name is Dr. Steven Talugende. He is the chief of HIV AIDS and uh, the United Nations uh, Interim Force in Lebanon. And prior to that, he was the HIV policy advisor to the United Nations operation in Burundi. Uh, he has experience on HIV, uh, HIV in, uh, among uniformed personnel, and in peace uh, keeping operations, particularly in Uganda and in, in uh, among defense forces. And he has also uh, supported several UN peacekeeping missions uh, in, in Eritrea, Ethiopia, East Timor, Minuso, uh, in Western Sahara, and also in Liberia. His, he, he, his work contributed to the deployment of the HIV capability in all peacekeeping operation. And uh, he was the executive director for, a director for Africa at Mid May International Commissioner at Uganda AIDS Commission and Chief Executive Officer for HIV AIDS Civil Society Network in Uganda. You know, he has a lot of uh, 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 experience in this field. So he's the one that will be leading us today uh, and just to, to, to talk about uh, HIV and HIV stigmatization and the impact that this may have on, on the program. Uh, over to you, Dr. Steven. Hello, hello, hello. Can, can you hear, you hear me? me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. You can go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I got some technical glitch a little bit, but it has been fixed. Um, first of all, I'm happy to be here with you today. I, I look forward to this session so much, but most importantly is um, to, to, to clarify something from my, the introduction, Dr. Fuller said, I specialize in public health, but I'm not a medical doctor. So uh, I think that one can shed some basic clarification on that. Um, I'm here to talk about stigma and discrimination. Stigma in the sense that today, as we look at the last uh, decade in the 23rd agenda, and our target uh, today. Hello? Steve, can, you, can you share your slide or you're you not there yet? I'm, I'm going to come there. Okay. I'm coming. But I just want to share some things more before we start. I don't know whether anybody has an idea on what we are talking about and what it feels like in your respective uh, places of work when we talk about stigma and discrimination, especially in the context of HIV. Anybody that would wish to share an experience, one or two? Hello? Hi, doctor. Uh, sorry, uh, we disabled the microphone for our participants. Oh, really? How? Yes. Can we connect to them? Hello? Yeah, I don't think that's going to be possible right now uh, unless... Uh, Yuan Yuan, uh, will you be able to change the settings? Me? No, no, no. I'm asking uh, one of our colleagues. Who has, yes, and uh, somebody. I don't think it's possible right now, doctor. So you can probably proceed. Uh, maybe I think you they can will. Proceed, please. Uh, yes. How come yours are not uh, disabled? Uh, because this you is the for the present, and they give you the capability to to present. Yeah. Yes. Oh, they are not given the, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, let me just uh, share my screen. Uh, 
I'm just loading the, the presentation. Is it visible now? Yeah, we can see it now. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah. All right. So once again, welcome to the session and um, we'll be taking a little of your time discussing stigma as it relates to HIV. And today we will drill a lot on things like first of all, understanding the basics because it is over for almost 40 years since the HIV outbreak. But to date, we are still talking about stigma. And the fundamental question is why are we still talking about stigma? We expect to be towards ending AIDS uh, as a public health threat by 2030. But now, eight months, eight years away, we still faced by the, the pandemic of stigma. So, Understanding the basics, we th I thought it would be a good idea, first of all, before we get into really stigma related to HIV, its impact on the HIV AIDS response, and what ways we can put in place to address the HIV related stigma that uh, still disturbs our interventions. Um, there is a lot, a lot of uh, scientific and uh, academic work that has been done on stigma. I picked particularly this one because it picks an origin of how stigma started. And it says the Greeks originated the term stigma to refer to bodily signs designed to expose something unusual or bad about the moral status of somebody that is regarded to be different from the rest of the people. And some of these signs were deeply cut and burnt into people's bodies and advertised that the bearer was either a slave, a criminal, or somebody that practiced uh, unacceptable behavior according to the standards of values of that community. To an extent, they regarded them as traitors, people with blush meat kind of uh, uh, characteristics ritually polluted, to be avoided, especially in public places. To a certain extent, when we go to the real uh, social aspects and the uh, criminalizing laws, now we talk about people being uh, criminalized, investigated, sometimes prosecuted because of the things that are different that they have done. Uh, This has had a very tremendous kind of impact on the HIV response because stigma is a socially constructed idea or perspective or set of perspectives that creates and perpetuates social inequalities which can end up leading to discrimination. Its stigma involves sets of distinct psychological systems designed by nature by natural selection to solve specific problems associated with society and social sociality. Here we find the basis within the social constructions, which led to defining stigma and we'll be looking at it more in depth ahead. It is part of the early human response uh, that was used to address things like transmissible and incurable health conditions and it was used in times of lipa, uh, lip, I mean leprosy and other infections. And the challenge is that this one manifests itself at the individual, at the interpersonal, the organizational, community and policy levels. So as we talk today, in this time of the 23rd agenda, we need to be clear about how what we do impacts on the response against HIV, the needs of individuals that we see every day based on this basis 
based on these basic facts. For example, stigma has its drivers and things that facilitate it, the marking related to stigma, its manifestations, and the outcomes related to health and how this all is impacted upon. So uh, it is prudent upon us that we do whatever it takes to understand these differences and the factors that can be caused by our methods of work, our own attitudes, because we are socially, uh, we are social human beings. We live in the society and we have grown up in a society that has been constructed, that also constructs the way we behave, the way we relate, and the way we support other people. You can be a professional in different categories, but there is one fact that stays, that stigma is part of us. It is a day-to-day -day thing, probably since when we were born. Some, thing, some kind of messages that we hear, some kind of messages that we get, some kind of messages that we personally disseminate. And so it involves a lot of aspects that we have to be careful about when we are dealing with the people. So, I think I'm having a problem with my slides. Okay, stigma by definition is an attribute that is deeply discrediting and reduces people from the whole and use of people to those that are tainted and discounted ones. People's social standing is totally disgraced. They are shamed and they are regarded as socially unacceptable, unfitting. This is another element that we need to keep in mind. Those attributes can be related to illnesses, physical deformities, bad behaviors, ethnicity, religion, social groups, and all this probably we are all familiar and have experienced. But it uh, stigmatizes people or groups of people see others differently. And sometimes others also see themselves different because of the characterization, because of the stigmatizing uh, condition that they could be uh, exposed to. Therefore, stigma and discrimination have a relationship, but sometimes they are used interchangeably. Uh, discrimination is treating individuals or groups of people with prejudice, with all kinds of biases you can talk of. To you, at, uh, to us as, uh, as health workers, we need to be asking about what are the biases I have about HIV as me? And how do these biases impact on the way I do my work as a healthcare worker? What can I do different in order to improve the kind of services that I provide? Because stigma reflects as an attitude on us in the things that we do. The, th the beliefs that we have in mind are of what constitutes an acceptable or an unacceptable condition or behavior or practice. And yet discrimination is an act. The things we do as a result of uh, stigma. Uh, it involves a lot of dimensions. If you look at the concealability, the disruptiveness, the visual qualities, it, 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 it attracts its origin, as I said at the beginning, and the danger that is associated with the fact that people end up being stigmatized. And the issue here is that visibility is a, quite a crucial factor when we are talking about uh, stigma, and we need to know that the more visible a stigmatized condition can be, the greater its negative impact on interactions, the way people relate with one another, the way we relate with our patients, with the way we relate with our clients and other people that come to us for services. So 
You may be looking at a person as an individual, but at the same time, you need to consider the bigger picture of that stigmatizing uh, condition and how it affects an individual person as a member of a social network. The stigmatized are always forced to bear the visible mark symbolizing their discredited status. Uh, I work in a peacekeeping, uh, a peacekeeping mission, and from time to time we see that pre-deployment HIV testing is mandatory. But those who test positive are made to believe that they cannot be sent to peacekeeping because it can negatively impact their health. And therefore, they take to bear that mark of being HIV positive and can't be deployed in peacekeeping. Individuals with stigmatizing conditions perceived as preventable suffer more social censure than those perceived as helpless victims. This is another fundamental issue that we need to keep in mind. I'm recommending an HIV test for patient X because they is presented with this condition. But then take a, more, a little more time to think of the perception of the social environment around the person. Let me say, as I said, I'm a peacekeeper. What is, what is the condition like in the contingent where they come from? How about the country where they come from? Is HIV criminalized? And how, what is the nature and scope of stigma and discrimination that exists in that country? And it is all this that you should base your decision on whether to recommend an HIV now or to provide wise counsel to the individual so that they can seek testing whenever they have an appropriate environment that can provide the support. And these dimensions also include things mark, the mark that is pursued, the under control of the stigmatized correlates with negative attitudes. Yeah. <laughs> if, like, for example, we normally hear that that one got infected, uh, whoever gets infected, it is because they had sex with a commercial sex worker. They got infected because they are gay. They got infected because they are promiscuous. They got infected because it was a sin, it is a curse from God. And all these come from the kind of global nature of who we are. So if for things that, that are related to things that are perceived to be under someone's control, then they attract negative attitudes and behaviors towards that, that individual or groups of individuals. Conditions that are out of control of the individual can also uh, lead to very harsh stigmatizing conditions. For example, when you have HIV, it doesn't matter how you got it. The issue is you will be subject to stigmatization. Even if you got it through exchange of blood, mother to child transmission, including children who are born with HIV, they end up being stigmatized. Because regardless of whether it is seen as something that was because of something that was beyond their control. But at the same time, uh, discriminatory and criminalizing laws, policies and practice do not discriminate, uh, they consider those aspects. They look at the whole of it as criminalized behavior, unacceptable condition that attracts negativity from the community, and most importantly, from, all, from us as well. Then it disrupts interpersonal relationships because of the different situations that I've talked about. For example, family members may not be willing to support a person living with HIV that is born in the family. We have seen where people have been ostracized and rejected. Healthcare workers have denied people from accessing services or even delayed for different reasons that later on we'll be talking about. Stigmatization can be disrupting than living with HIV. Actually, the biggest scare that prevent people from accessing services related to HIV is the disruption caused by stigma. 
the fear caused by, it, by stigma. People fear stigma more than they fear HIV. Uh, the perception of danger triggers that reaction as well, contributes to that reaction. And therefore, the way people uh, estimate the danger in an interaction is how they react. For example, demanding an antibody HIV testing pre-surgery prevents us as health workers from thinking about things like the window period, from thinking that pre-surgery, uh, pre I'm going to use an antibody test. But because of the fear, you don't even think so, uh, th you don't even think about those other risk factors that may exist. And so there are so many issues that why this is why we chose to take this presentation like this. And how is stigma expressed? There is social stigma that leads to isolation and people isolated by their families, by their friends, and people can be isolated from their communities. Then stigma leads to noisiness or tokenism. Like, for example, the UN has led the global response and we have seen a volume of commitments and standards. But to an extent, when you critically look at it, there is no meaningful support for their action, for their putting in practice. All this is just because of the stigma. Loss of social role and identity of individuals that are known to be infected. And this is where you can, again, I will keep on repeating this as healthcare workers, we needed to really critically look at what I am about to do is likely to cause a mammoth kind of effect on the individual, on their social network, on their family, and what they can do thereafter. With the physical st uh, stigma, people are isolated, shunned, and even abandoned. I see here somebody uh, tests positive, they are like they have never been part of the, of the group. Uh, they separate spaces. There is a, 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 there is possibility of violence for those who have heard of the case of Gugu Dlamini in South Africa. I think it was uh, around 99 or something like that. She was HIV positive. She was beautiful. She was a younger girl. Younger boys were coming to her. And because she knew she was HIV positive, she chose to openly uh, testify about her HIV positive status in South Africa. And following her testimony, her own community came, pulled her out of her house and killed her. So this is how far stigma can go and can cause effect. And then the self stigma, people see and hear all these things that are happening in their communities, and then they apply it to themselves they start seeing themselves in, with feelings of shame, the fear of disclosure, the isolation. Some even commit suicide, some even attempt suicide. The despair grows significantly as a, a result of self-stigma. It prevents people from testing and even seeking HIV-related treatment because they fear, what if my friends knew? What if... Uh, my colleague saw me coming to the HIV unit. We hear so much of this. Oh my God, if you talked to me and I was concerned because maybe my colleague suspected something that I tested for HIV and I come to your unit for service or support. And so there are so many factors that accompany uh, expression of stigma. Then there are those verbal stigma, gossip, the UN is a network of, of human resources where almost everybody knows everybody or in a network, somebody knows somebody elsewhere. And when um, uh, information comes out, everybody is like, everybody is going to know about my situation. Or you find the people talking and say, oh, Stephen, do you know so and so that we had in this mission, on that mission? And you're like, oh my God, what, what really happened? So this uh, human resource network of, uh, of the UN is also in a way a stigmatizing factor because the, of the, the gossip that runs around the organization. And therefore, as I said, 
be careful when you recommend a certain kind of service because it is quite challenging to manage the effects that, that, that accompany the situation that may emerge out of that. The labeling, like the misleading information that HIV is in Africa, you find somebody in a different country talking about HIV in that particular country, but they don't take time to even discuss what is in that country. They are busy looking at Africa. Africa is having its own issues, but here you are addressing issues based on your own social environment. Why don't you discuss factors that are there? And this one keeps on misleading people. The relationships to, with promiscuity, unfaithfulness, sinfulness, and all that comes out in what people say. And every time you say something to somebody, just remember one thing, that you are talking to somebody who has a network of friends, of family, of community, where they belong to. Depending on your status, whether you are a health worker or a significant person in the, in the, in the social environment, then they are fearful that I wanted to go and take an HIV test. But if this is how this friend of mine thinks, then there is nobody that I can share with my HIV situation. And people cho choose to keep quiet. Institutionalized stigma, we have seen, and I still see cases whereby people come and say, oh, this guy tested positive, I think he's not fit to work here. We need to repatriate them. People get disgraced. People see their colleagues as betrayers. I see this on a daily basis. I go from one contingent to another and I hear what people say. When I ask, what do you think about HIV AIDS and your group? And somebody is like, oh, if somebody tests positive to HIV here, be sure we'll be, we will investigate and prosecute because it is unacceptable because HIV is a result of sex with a, a sex worker or brutes, like they call them, injecting drug users. Otherwise, there is no other way they know. And this is the UN that we work for. These are the colleagues we, we support every day. But the diversity drives this institutionalized stigma to a new level that sometimes when we are making decisions, we don't even find the time to think about. Uh, now let's look at HIV related how, when H, uh, stigma attaches itself or relates to, to HIV. This is according to UNAIDS. I think this report is 2022. Stigma and discrimination increases the risk of HIV acquisition and progression to AIDS. This looks like a redundant statement, but it has a strong uh, grounding in our prevention efforts our treatment, care, and support. Why? Because where there is a stigma, there is a fear, there is ignorance, there is in, uh, unwillingness to even learn about HIV. Because people think that if you ask much about HIV, they suspect you to be having a problem somehow, and therefore you, are, you risk being stigmatized. Those who want to take uh, to, to seek HIV testing can't go for testing because they fear the stigma. Those who want treatment, they fear. And therefore, the left, people who are living with HIV live in, in ignorance. The community lives in, in ignorance and then transmission continues. Whereas when it comes to progression to AIDS, where there is a high level of stigma, there is significant mental breakdown in the person living with or affected with HIV. They can't eat well. They can't take care of themselves because of the stress attached to the stigma or attached to AIDS or the HIV that they, are, they have. And therefore, somebody that would have lasted much longer breaks down fast enough simply because of the effects of stress associated with the stigma. Yeah, stigma increases violence, as I said. It increases marginalization. It increases persecution. Depending on where you work, where you are, who you are serving, 
as a UN staff member, it is important for us to put into context these factors as we provide care and support to people. Because stigma reduces access to education, including preparedness of our personnel before they deploy. Sometimes we want to do the mandatory orientation to people who are always active in field work, but they tell you, you can hear some things like, uh, it is not a priority for us. The priority is this, the priority is that. Yet for us, the way we, what we do is we design a training or a session for a group depending on its tasks, its social environment, and the things that we expect could increase the vulnerability and risks. Uh, stigma is the greatest challenge that we have today in achieving the 2030 targets. Those of you who have been able to see dangerous inequalities, probably you understand what I'm talking about. The dangerous inequalities is, it was, is a report that was launched recently by UNAIDS, and it is looking at how inequalities are fueling HIV and how it, uh, inequalities are failing uh, the, the international community in achieving the targets of ending AIDS as a public health issue. Stigma and discrimination impedes the HIV response at almost every level. And simply because it limits access to HIV prevention services, it limits access to treatment, testing, uh, even treatment literacy, adherence, but some, I've seen UN colleagues who get HIV treat related treatment, but they fear to, re to, to claim for refunds from the insurance. One colleague actually told me recently that I can't because I fear that those people could share my information with my other colleagues. And they, we are talking about eight years away from the 20th, uh, to, to, uh, from 2030, and I'm talking about a UN staff member with a full coverage of insurance. Then uh, the broader sexual reproductive health and related services are, are limited. Even when you're talking about HIV, when we talk to people, somebody say, oh, no, 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 don't talk about sex. Our people don't do these kind of things. Even within the social environment, even with, within homes, but it also, uh, uh, the relationship between HIV and other opportunistic infections like TB, because when you have TB, they tend to try to link you to HIV related services by promoting testing. But sometimes it is done the wrong way. And therefore people fear even these screenings for these services because they know that if you test for, with, uh, for TB, or oh, there is a possibility that you'll be linked to HIV, HIV, which is an abomination in my society. And what causes stigma? It is rooted in the fear of HIV. Even among us as healthcare workers, we are intimidated by the fear to a level that we don't even find the time to look at the real facts that we must know in order to provide appropriate care. Many of our ideas about HIV come from those images. If you look at, you can see these pictures. I, I used, when I was growing up from, I, I used to see these pictures on the electric poles to indicate danger. And this, these are horror, kind of images that increased the fear. And these images are still rampant in people's minds, in people's thoughts. And as a result, the stigma continued to grow. The misconceptions about how HIV is transmitted, how to live with it, what it means to be affected by and vulnerable to it, and how to work holistically. Today, these <laughs> cause a lot of stigma. 
the misconceptions, the things that we don't understand well, yet we perceive them to be true. We have no idea of the truth about it, but we still hold those negative perceptions or misconceptions. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have your mics uh, activated, but I just ask you to find time for yourself to ask this, to respond to this question. What kind of loss reaction do you experience after testing positive to HIV? Take one minute. You can write in the, um, the message link. What kind of loss reaction? Do you experience after testing positive to HIV? Just imagine it was you who tested positive today, this hour. How are you likely to react to that, to, to that result? How would you feel when you get an HIV positive result? What kind of care or support would you need as a result of knowing that you are newly, uh, newly knowing that you have been infected with HIV. Probably this would give us the understanding and developing uh, the empathetic reasoning when dealing with the HIV related issues. Because here you have the relationship with the reality and you sit in practical terms and say, I think I experienced something during this thinking process. And therefore, I needed to think otherwise and I needed to do something differently. And the stigma impacts the response because of its basis and root, root uh, being rooted into sex, gender identity, sexual orientation, ID use, sex work, and generally the HIV status. Because those first messages, in fact, I remember reading an article one time I was on a flight and I say, I saw that very odd message somebody had was, was trying to bring it up, the gay disease. That is one of the first messages that journalists were using, sensational and scaring things, which made uh, those who are not gay to think that for us, that thing is not with us. It doesn't relate to us. I therefore don't care. So long as I'm not gay, so long as I'm not a sex worker, so long as I'm not an IDU, so long as I don't have nothing, I have nothing to be concerned about HIV. Stigmatizing experiences, I said, I talked about the girls, the verbal abuses and social rejection, and the stigmatizing behavior that affect rights to employment, but rights to services. Anybody that comes for services, whether they are HIV positive or not, they need it to be treated fairly. But when these services are disrupted by virtue of our HIV related negative attitudes, then we deny people important services that they would need. Probably you could be the, the game changer that could empower somebody to go an extra mile. So at the same time, when I'm looking at this, I also consider your simple decision can change somebody's life forever, for the worst or for the best. And therefore it is up to us to choose whether we want to impact people's lives for the best or for the worst. Stigma can be enshrined, I've, I say, again, I will repeat again and again. Uh, when uh, Winnie Anima was launching the report, I think she said that about 68 countries, I don't remember very well, still have criminalizing laws. And therefore, if you are working with UN staff members, UN personnel, contractor, contractors or whatever, you need to think what kind of laws exist in this one of the country. We know, I know of one mission where to renew uh, the resident cards of UN staff, they needed to do an HIV test. 
And all this still exists and still practiced, even though member states have all signed up to the international standards of the HIV response. But criminalization remains a fundamental issue. And when you are, for example, in a peacekeeping environment, please be very careful on the way you do testing for HIV. If it is not an emergency, if it is not necessary, better do not do it, so long as you know you are not able to address the fundamental issues that somebody needs related to HIV. <clears throat> Uh, stigma and discrimination increases the risks, as I said, of getting infected with HIV and progression to HIV. But UNAIDS put this in the report of 2021. HIV-related discrimination and stigma, where it leads to rights violation, uh, violations, is a human rights issue. People have a right to protect from this. Uh, for, to protection from discrimination and life of dignity when stigmatizing attitudes do not impede enjoyment of their full rights, including the rights to education, health care, access to justice, privacy, family, bodily autonomy, and other rights. It is a part of our duty to uphold these commitments that are done by the organization. Um, I mean, again, I want to, use, to refer to some data. Across countries with available data up to 21% uh, of people living with HIV reported being denied health care in the past 12 months. The question is here to you, has this ever happened in your workplace? If so, what action do we need to take or was taken to address it? In 11 countries with available data, up to 40% of people with HIV reported being forced to submit to a medical or health procedure. 40%. I regard this one to be very high. 26% of women living with HIV reported that they received, that receiving HIV treatment was conditioned on taking contra contraceptives. So if somebody says, I'm not, I, I want to have a baby and I'm a woman, you don't even pay attention to her current need. If you are not taking contraceptives, then you can't give you treatment. The stigma index analysis found that HIV related discrimination caused a or con contributed to job loss in more than 50% of cases in seven out of 11 countries in this data. This is another thing, a simple test you did or you may do that goes on to tend to discount somebody's life can lead them to losing employment. It is an action that we have to be concerned about. The LGBTI workers, there's evidence that they are subjected to criminalization and sometimes even violence. In my own country, it happens a lot. And so for us as health, as health workers working for the UN, these are fundamental things that we have to think about. Simple action can mean devastating effects to anybody. But the seven countries still maintain travel restrictions. People from key populations face high levels of stigma, discrimination, and violence. We just felt that it is important for us also to know this detail, not just the normal way we have been talking about the stigma and its effects. This is factual information that is way beyond what we have always had. But the fundamental question is how do we? contribute to changing this. And if we are to change it, we need it to, we need it to change it yesterday. We need it to change it last month. We need it to change it last year. And today I'm just challenging each one of us to critically sit back and think of what action you are likely to take 
in order to address these issues. I just want to take a minute to share some of the kind of scenarios we have seen in our experience in peacekeeping. How a service colleague responds on a call to fix a technical issue. After completing the task, he later finds out that the colleague he just served was living with HIV. He rushes to the HIV unit to seek PEP. But after the HIV carried out a risk analysis and found out that actually the allegation, the issues he was raising had no basis and therefore there was no risk. But the reason why do you think he did this? He did this because of the fear for HIV, thinking that casual contact or being next to a person living with HIV could cause infection. The second scenario is a publicly open HIV positive colleague got regularly excluded from implementing mandated tasks of, of his section. On a consultation, he was informed that he was not fit to cut out substantial work because of his HIV positive status. Fortunately, the mission leadership team took disciplinary action to that supervisor who had stigmatized and discriminated the colleague. And they emphasized the need to maintain a stigma-free environment. And this is also another call on you. If you have no idea, please ask, inquire, find out more. And when you do find out, for sure, you'll be able to do the right thing at the right time. A uniformed colleague went to a medical unit for a minor surgical procedure. The attendant doctor demanded for an HIV test. The, the, the patient objected and the procedure was delayed. It took intervention of the HIV unit for him to be served. The question here is why was this demand? Probably we, these are part of our questions we needed to ask ourselves. But one of the, 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 the concerns is also driven by fear. I put up this slide today to remind you colleagues that if we, we make such demands, we forget some things, basic things, like the window period. During the window period, a person tests negative but the person is infected. If you look at the red line in that, in that graph, it indicates that during the window period, the somebody's viral load is so high compared to the any time of living with HIV. The next time a person has such high viral load is when they already have AIDS defining conditions. This means that somebody in the window period can easily transmit infection to another person. But unfortunately, we are using antibody HIV tests, and then we use that as a false security. And here I think, and I feel, we should apply, apply conservatively the um, uh, universal safety precautions. Your risk can be addressed by adhering to universal safety precaution that than this false security caused by pre-surgical kind of HIV testing, because you can never know. And therefore, it is important for us to mitigate stigma within our workplace, harmonize and replace our diverse laws, policies, practices, and perspectives of our home countries with the standards of conduct, legislation, and policies of the United Nations. If you have your own home country understanding of the laws and practices, please, when you get to the UN, harmonize what you, you have been practicing with what the organization stands up to, the values and the standards of conduct. Uh, it is our duty to monitor stigma-related violations and reinforce stigma and discrimination reduction campaigns 
provide a consistent policy literacy and sensitization of all personnel. We count on you because for us we always very we very few people. But if we work together, you also understand the best ways of responding to HIV within your workspace than doing the wrong things with wrong for or false security. We need to strengthen coordination within ourselves, but also with other pillars and other functions, because response to stigma is holistic and multidisciplinary. We cannot just do it as a few people. We need to continuously train our healthcare, uh, our healthcare providers and remind them of this responsibility, promoting rights, uh, adhering to medical ethics for HIV, and apply safe and standard procedures and practices at all times. Uh, the, EU, the WHO and UNAIDS refers to this as a combination of prevention programs. Probably this slide explains when you are looking at the medical factors, understand that medical practice exists within a much complex social environment where there are behavioral aspects, there are political and legal, uh, legal and economic factors. There are social environmental factors surrounded by social and cultural practices. It is only after we put all this in proper perspective that we'll be able to address the risks and the vulnerabilities caused by stigma and discrimination at the workplace. Finally, uh, allow me to say thank you because it is unfortunate that we couldn't interact somehow along the way. But I want to end by saying, why stigma? Uh, why stopping stigma matters? It is when people are afraid of experiencing discrimination, they are less likely to test or treat for HIV. People will fear to come to you. People will fear to come to us. People will fear to talk to their colleagues. People will fear to talk to their families. And therefore, the only thing we have is to join hands and address stigma at our best that we can offer. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen, for this uh, wonderful presentation, very detailed, and you have actually given us a lot of information on stigma and actually I, I like the second to the last slide where you actually mentioned some of the core areas that we're supposed to focus on when we are uh, looking at the the way uh, this particular slide exactly we are out to actually address uh, the issue of stigma and also uh, when you raise the point that this is an holistic approach uh, everybody must be involved. And you know, you mentioned something, monitor stigma related viol violations. I mean, it's something that you monitor, that you will see. If you don't monitor, you won't see. So colleagues, let's, uh, wherever we are located, uh, wherever the situation we are, we are in, let's look for some of these things because these are some of the elements that are actually preventing access to all our services. I mean, you know, even during COVID, the issue of stigma started popping up during COVID. Uh, well, once um, I'm, I'm, I've been labeled as COVID-19 positive now, then everybody in the colleague in the office will run away from me. In fact, I've had to uh, intervene where somebody was positive in an office and they wrote us that, okay, we should find a way of getting this person out of the office. And uh, it was so uh, messy. So stigma can actually cause a lot of pain, like Dr. Steven mentioned. I have a question. It's not for you, it's for me. Uh, somebody asked, I think it's Yusuf that has the question. Could it be stigma and discrimination that led to the recent decision by the United Nations to remove the HIV and AIDS cause from the list of mandatory causes for UN personnel? You know, if you go on the list of the uh, HIV mandatory causes online now, you won't see the HIV AIDS cause there. Uh, 
to respond to Yusuf and for anybody that may be having some kind of uh, uh, thinking why, the reason why we have decided to remove the HIV aid course from the list of mandatory courses is this. The platform that they are using to host that uh, training changed. And so the uh, current training, uh, the, the, the one that was there before, was this some kind of old format. So it's not compatible. It's more or less like an issue of ICT. So now we have to look for uh, experts who can actually help us to adapt the HIV uh, aid <coughs> course to fit into the new platform. It's not only our training. Actually, several training were put down because they are not compatible with the with the uh, new platform being introduced. And hopefully, once we are able to get the new uh, uh, adaptation done, we should be putting the course up back again. This is something that we actually discussed internally, and it's very good uh, for you to raise this question. At least people in this forum will have we, we know that we the reason why we 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 removed the the training. Um, also, somebody asked. Let me see. OK, I think this is for you now. He said negative propaganda may also impact on the stigmatization, especially in relation to the care of the victim. How can this challenge be addressed? Negative propaganda may also impact on the stigmatization, especially in relation to the, to the, to the care of the victim. How can this challenge be addressed? So over to you. Well, negative propaganda. Today in the UN, we are calling it this and misinformation. There is a dedicated uh, intervention that has been established to address this and misinformation. I remember writing to you, Dr. Fola, that we, we have this going on and now it is time now to start focusing on what kind of this and misinformation relates to HIV. And, there are, and therefore, I agree with him that this negative propaganda needed to be included in the uh, interventions that we are using in the organization to address this and misinformation. For the first uh, issue of the training, Dr. Fowler, the messaging, that email sent a big stigmatizing message to the recipients because it has taken us a long time to undo the damage it did down here in the field. And therefore, since you have clarified, we would appreciate if a follow-up message uh, clarifying the, this issue is sent out to everybody to understand, especially mission leadership. Uh, I see a hand, Dr. Fowler. Uh, somebody mentioned that, uh, uh, one minute. There is a hand, somebody, is has put up a hand uh can you type your question please i think the access is limited to the presenter if um, you type your question we can see it unfortunately oh, okay. we cannot deactivate this thing again I'm, I'm... all right one more thing just to add to it is that the training if you go on the on the uh uh, on the system. The training is actually there. You see the online. Anybody or any office that wants to use it, they can still use it. But the thing is, you won't see it among the list of mandatory, mandatory training. Mandatory training. Yes. So if you see go on the platform, you can see assess the training. You can still do the training. But the only thing is you won't see it among the list of the, the mandatory uh, uh, training. Now. Yeah. Do we have any other question? Uh, Please, if you have any other further question, can you just type it into the chat box? Otherwise, we will free uh, Stephen to leave. Yeah, I, I, I really feel so much, uh, Dr. Fowler, that uh, we count on you as well to address stigma in the UN. We need your lead especially in addressing things like some of those cases, the, the scenarios I shared. These are real, these are, this is just a synopsis. This is just a drop in the ocean. 
I remember we exchanged and said, do you want us to use this kind of scenarios or you, you want to, to structure them? But these needs to be addressed with a real serious approach to addressing stigma. Because HIV programming will not work for UN personnel if this kind of stigma is not addressed. I wanted to say, if you look at HIV being treated from uh, a practical point of view, we see sometimes as if we are treated differently. Why? Uh, rules and regulations affecting other functions, especially uh, the thematic groups, they are, mm. followed, they are followed verbatim, word after word. But why is it that for HIV, uh, so many issues start flag, being flagged and different excuses. You saw the discussion we had about mm -hmm. the treatment and advancement and how HIV is no longer is an issue. This was at a time when the dangerous report had just come out, when the General Assembly had just adopted the resolution on addressing inequalities. So we keep on getting confused. Therefore, uh, Dr. Fola, we call on you and we are here work with you in driving a response that promotes a stigma-free environment. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for this. Uh, I mean, this is part of what uh, I mentioned in, I mean, in the in this slide that is actually popping up, uh, where you mentioned that this is an holistic approach. Uh, we can't do it alone. Uh, we'll put in our, our own effort from here, and we definitely need your support to 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 find solution to some of these issues that are popping up and uh, uh, some of these things are actually being discussed internally and when we have like some kind of um, uh, strategic uh, information this will actually be shared uh, accordingly to all the the the, the stakeholders I'm looking through the question again to see if I have anybody sending additional question um okay somebody said we need to find means of pushing hiv agenda through the mental health strategy platform yeah th 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 this is true uh and this is part of what we have actually been discussing uh internally um yeah apparently we we addressed all the questions uh colleague thank you so much for your time and for participating and uh just to to cap the everything uh we will need your support by uh having your eyes open to monitor and to work uh with us as a team because we need a lot of coordinations to ensure that issue of uh, stigmatization uh is not popping up in our uh d2 stations and missions again and like i mentioned uh, if we only focusing, if you look at HIV now, we have this issue in HIV, it's popping up in, uh, in, 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 in during the COVID-19 pandemic also. And this is some of the things that have been flagged and raised with the, the, the leadership to see or find a way of addressing some of these things. And like Stephen mentioned in, 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 as part of his pre, uh, presentation, we need training, reorientation of everybody for us to gear up and find solution to all this. Uh, one minute. One minute. Dr. One minute. Something, something quick. One minute. One minute. I'm trying to look for one of the. Uh, no. Okay. Not a question again. Okay. Yeah, uh, Dr. Fuller, I've seen uh, most of these uh, the, uh, leadership decisions are driven by reports like, like the hippo. The hippo report. Mm. But also there is one that was done for uh, on health of peacekeepers or something like that. Mm. But they are used to determine strategic direction of HIV programming. Yet when these reports were written, they didn't even measure any single variable related to HIV. Neither did they even mention HIV once. Mm. And yet they are the ones that are being used uh, to, to, to do strategic direction. And therefore, this is another area that we need to be clear. We have so many reports related to HIV. If 
those two did not include HIV, then we have to call on that that we have available to guide the, in me, the internal AIDS response. It is very unfortunate that we can tell member states do this, do this, when we can't even do it in our own home. Mm. Yeah, I get your point. I mean, I mean, this is part of what we discussed uh, uh, earlier. And uh, we'll find this, uh, uh, a way forward on this, and uh, this will be communicated accordingly to, uh, to all the stakeholders. And um, again... Maybe my, uh, last, my last one, Dr. Fuller, you needed to follow up and reactivate UN+. Plus. UN+, Plus had helped so many people. Here, I had been, I used to receive so many people referred by UN+. Plus. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. So I think we need, it is out of stigma that UN plus has gone, I don't know, to a certain low level of silence. Mm. But that one does not take away the fact that we had UN plus and we do have UN plus. And therefore yeah. we need to create that conducive environment that re restarts the, the work of UN plus because it was doing a lot of good work for people. Yeah, I agree with you on this. Uh, I mean, the last message here is that uh, part of the SG message on what is day was that we are on track in achieving the 2030 target, but we all need to do more. There are, you, can, oh. you see, like, Doctor, we, if we, Doctor, if, Doctor, wait, 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 Dr. Steven, wait, Dr. Steven, we need to wrap up now because uh, people may not want to jump one or two meetings, but I need to wrap up now because the, uh, of our time. But the most important thing is this. We need to do more. We still have a lot of ground to cover. The consumption that oh, uh, we are at the top or we are achieving everything uh, is there, but we still need to do more. We still have a lot of ground to cover uh, for us to be able to achieve this 2030. 2030, between 2030, this is 2022. You are talking of eight years time. So there's a lot of ground that we can cover within this uh, period. Uh, we'll be reaching out to all of us uh, uh, during, uh, for our next uh, meeting. Um, this will probably be either early, sometimes early next year. If it's not in January, it's gonna be sometimes in February. And hopefully uh, we'll see some of, if we, we are able to address some of those things before then, or if some of those things uh, are still in the pipeline of being uh, achieved. This will be uh, duly communicated to everyone. So again, thank you very much for your participation. We need to wrap up now because of our time. And I know some of you are in locations that are almost like in, in the evening time. So thanks for taking, I mean, we have taken more than uh, almost extra 10, almost extra 10 more minutes now. Uh, so everybody, thank you so much for your participation. Steven, thank you so much for your very insightful contribution and participation. I appreciate everyone. Have a wonderful day and, and 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 enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much.